Hi, good morning. It's me, Tim Dodd, the Everyday Astronaut. Oy. Four hours of sleep, more launches to come. So uh, how are you guys doing? Hope you guys are ready for... I I know it's, it's just a Starlink mission for SpaceX, but it's actually... It's got some cool little things that we need to talk about on why I'm actually waking up this early after streaming Rocket Lab last night until 2 a.m. So uh, let's go on ahead. Anytime you guys have questions about upcoming rocket launches... And you want to know where is it going, what's it doing, blah, 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 and why it's, maybe, you know, maybe why it's cool or whatever. You can go to everydayastronaut.com, click on upcoming launches, and here we go, guys. We have an article for you. Uh, this is Starlink 16. It's the 16th operational Starlink mission. And, uh, yeah, the, the time for liftoff is uh, 13.02 UTC or 8.02 a.m. Eastern time. So, obviously, you can tell on the top uh, right hand corner of your screen that's 27 basically 28 minutes away from right now so uh yeah let's go through why this one is is of, of interest i mean we'd stream it pr even if it wasn't that particular interesting most of the time but this one actually has some cool some cool little cool little tidbits also i'm not going to be able to speak very well i am not enough sleep <laughs> so uh okay so the mission name for this is starlink version one l16 which is Technically, the seventeenth Starlink mission, even though it was sixteen, uh, just because they did have one uh, dedicated Starlink mission before is version one. But this is uh, L um, L sixteen. So, all right, uh, the launch provider for this is SpaceX. SpaceX is the one doing this launch. They're the one that would you know normally a customer would you know hire them. Hey, put this into space. Okay, done. But today, the customer for this is also SpaceX because they are Starlink satellites, which is SpaceX's own uh, constellation. And so they're just doing it themselves. The rocket for this, this is the Falcon 9 Block 5. Now, here's something fun. It's booster 1051-8. So we can note one thing already just from the name of that serial number, the dash. Uh, it, we used to say period, but we found out that it should actually be a dash, so we change it to uh, dash so 1051 dash 8 it's a 38 day turnaround time for boosters so that's pretty nuts you know that's uh <laughs> that's the fastest and we'll talk about that here in a second uh but that's that's the fastest by quite a bit it was just the low 50s um so that's a good 25 percent improvement basically uh in turnaround time and <laughs> that's pretty nuts launch location this is taking off from launch complex 39a or lc 39a from Kennedy Space Center in Florida. Um, of course, I need to say this just so you know, uh, but LC instead of SLC, so you'll see either SLC 40 maybe or LC 39. Uh, LC 39 does denote just launch complex. It stands for launch complex. And it uh, means that it's at the Cape, uh, it's at the Kennedy Space Center side. If it's SLC, we might say slick 40 um, or slick 41 or slick 36 or whatever. Um, that would be something that's at on the Cape Canaveral Space Force Station side. So the same strip of land right there, um, but uh, it's just kind of a fun thing to note. The payload mass for this is 15,600 kilograms, around 34,000 pounds. Uh, so each each Starlink satellite is about 260 kilograms, and there's also a dispenser that that is not massless. <laughs> Where are these satellites going? They're eventually going out to a 550 kilometer circular low Earth orbit. Uh, they initially get parked in a 366 by 213 kilometer orbit, and then they do raise themselves uh, very slowly using literally Krypton powered thrusters. Look out, Superman. Um, oh, I just realized. What if, what if this is all actually an evil plot? Um, and they're just trying to make it so Superman can't visit us because they're just putting like krypton all the way around the planet i'm on to you guys i'm on to you spacex uh but yeah they they, they do basically raise and, and circularize their orbit using these krypton thrusters it takes a couple months to get into their final 550 kilometer circular orbit but yeah but at first they get into that elliptical orbit uh will they be attempting to recover the first stage yes yes they will uh where it'll be going 633 kilometers downrange on just read the instructions the uh, the tug and the support vessel for this is Hawk, and the support is Go Quest. Uh, will they be attempting to recover the fairings? Go Mystery and Go Mischief are stationed around 700 kilometers downrange for fairing recovery, so they are hopefully attempting to recover them. Whether or not they'll try and catch them, we'll hopefully find out on the webcast. Sometimes that's one of those things that they uh, don't even attempt, or you know, depending on weather, depending on 
um, a lot of things they might not actually attempt to catch them they might just simply scoop them out of the water because they've had good success even just doing that um, are these fairings new nope one uh, one fairing flew on Starlink version 1 L3 and L10 and the other flew on Starlink version 1 uh, L9 so 155 days and 167 day turnaround respectively so uh, yeah, so one has flown two times already, one half, because there is a, two fairing halves. Uh, one has flown twice already, and the other one just once. Uh, weather looking is 90% go as of recently. Uh, this will be the fastest turnaround time of a booster ever at 38 days, previously 51 days. Like I said, that's, that's a step in the right direction. That is awesome. Uh, the first time they've flown a booster for the eighth time. So this is the first, this is the life leader. This is the, the booster that has, uh, has absolutely flown the most so far, um, which is awesome to see. Again, another really good milestone. This is the seventh Falcon 9 launch without a static fire. Um, and that's, now don't forget, that's despite it being a fleet leader. So they're actually, feels like they're kind of gaining confidence, even though it's, uh, you know, even though it's the one that's flown the most. And you'd think you might be getting close to like the edge of the limits or something. They're just like, no, we're fine. Uh, this is the 105th Falcon 9 launch. Uh, which, by the way, uh, someone in Discord mentioned that uh, that this will put it uh, above the Ariane Five for number of launches, successful, successful launches. Thank you. Um, yep. So the Ariane Five has been flying for like 24 years. The Falcon Nine just under 11 years altogether. So uh, that's pretty impressive. Actually, I was kind of shocked. That I didn't realize the Ariane Five had flown quite that much, um, but. Pretty pretty nuts that that, uh, that they did it in such a short amount of time, and they're ramping up like crazy. I mean, their their flight rate is speeding up like nuts. Yeah, that is a hundred and five total Falcon Nine launches, not successful versus successful would be. Hmm. You're right. I don't think we're quite on par yet. Hmm. Anyway, we'll we'll think about that here in a second when it <laughs> when it gets to it. Um. Oh wow. Hey, by the way, um, w let's see. We we are safe from Superman. Wait. Oh, we got SpaceX stream starting up. That's great news. All right. So by the way, okay, we'll keep going here. Uh, this is the second reflight of a booster in 2021. Um. They are the fifth, wait, fifty-first <laughs> reflight of a booster, second re reflight of a booster in twenty twenty-one, seventy-second booster landing. That's insane. Uh, this will be the seventy or second, wait, twenty-second consecutive landing. Uh, a new record for SpaceX. Eighteenth landing attempt on just read the instructions. Seventeenth and eighteenth time they've reused a fairing half. Uh, the second launch for SpaceX this year. First SpaceX launch on January 20th, if you're looking at history, like we've, they've never launched on January 20th, which is a fun fact. Uh, 30th SpaceX launch from uh, from LC-39A, uh, and this will be the 1013th satellite uh, actually launched, the fifth orbital launch attempt of 2021, so all together. Um, I'm going to get this kind of pulled up here, and we'll get to some of your guys' comments while we're waiting. Let me make sure that we're actually in HD, because sometimes it tries to give us 720. <laughs> We don't want that. All right, so I'm going to have that just kind of pulled up here and off in the background. All right, so uh, let's get to some of you guys' comments here before we get started. Musical Wolves did get up. Thank you for tuning in again, uh, Musical Wolves. You were with us last night for the, I don't even know if it was last night, this morning, I don't know, for Rocket Lab. So thank you, Musical Wolves, for saying hi. Uh, I, I love it's always morning from Yellowstone National Park. That is awesome. Thank you. Uh, the mighty Sir, and, and another favorite, uh, and um, the mighty Sir Woof Woof of Clan Woof More, Tim. Uh, Tim, this is for the uh, needs coffee fund. Yes, wake up juice. I, yeah, I'm not gonna lie. This is. I'm just. I'm just watching this because I want to see this. Uh, this the booster is basically looking like it's completely black at this point, uh, and I want to. It's, it's. It is fun listening to these streams because at least we can see if there's any more information that they're uh, gonna let us know about. From uh, Nico D Nico Demo, uh, coffee for you, Tim. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. Uh, Carlos Otera, hi Tim. Hope you have a nice day. How excited are you about Demos and Phobos? Very excited. But we also totally saw this coming. Like we knew that SpaceX was going to be working. But for those of you who don't know, uh, SpaceX is already working on their orbital launch platforms um, at sea. The sea orbital launch platforms. 
And uh, yeah, they they're apparently naming them Deimos and Phobos. Of course, the moons of Mars, and that's awesome. Uh, we knew this was coming. Elon's been talking about it for for quite a while. So um, yeah, I, I'm just glad that it's it's coming to fruition and it's actually happening. So that is awesome. I'm I'm very excited. I think it'll be uh, a good move in the long run, just because uh, launching something like super heavy this close to populated areas, I'll be really happy if we see five super heavy launches from land here but we will see um i think that'd be a, i mean it's just gonna be <laughs> absolutely absolutely insane from among us clips we got when will starlink be out so it's currently in beta um it sounds like they might go public with it like um where anyone can just order it you know and get it to the doorstep by the end of the year uh that's definitely what they're aiming on it seems like that's they're probably on track for that. They do have quite a few more launches to really be able to fill in all of the gaps of Starlink because right now it can really only service northern latitudes. Um, above about, it seems like people are, are getting good results above about 45 degrees north, maybe a little lower than that. Um, but yeah, in order to fill in the, the southern, you know, like we're down here at around like 28 or something in South Texas, uh, Kennedy Space Center is at 28. Uh, in order to service those areas, they have to have substantially more just because of the way the, the orbits work. They, At their tops and bottoms of the orbit, they, there's a lot more overlap. And at the equator, there's a lot less overlap in those in the orbits. So uh, it'll be a little bit before it's still totally available anywhere around the, the Earth. But it's definitely, um, yeah, it's, it's definitely closing that gap. So, All right, uh, from Benjamin Herm. Uh, today was a good day to be an Aussie, a Rocket Lab launch at 5.30 p.m., and a SpaceX launch to close the night at 11.30 p.m. Yeah, you're lucky. You're lucky. The Rocket Lab launch for us was 1 a.m., and then this is uh, going to be at, at 7 a.m. So uh, by the time we closed up the stream and, and did all the stuff that we needed to do with YouTube and stuff, yeah, it was like <laughs> not very long ago. All right, here comes the SpaceX launch. Uh, I'll get to back to you guys' comments as soon as I can. Um, I promise. Thank you guys for saying hi. But uh, let's let's see if SpaceX can can just knock this out of the park and do a an eighth launch of a booster without even hardly thinking about it. <laughs> so, all right. I love this new intro, by the way. I feel like it's just awesome. But let's listen in here and see a side booster ignition. Six. Learn. Five. Four. Three. Two. One. Good morning. It's Wednesday, January 20th, and you're looking at a live view of Falcon 9 as it awaits its 8.02 a.m. Eastern Time launch from Pad 39A at Kennedy Space Center. My name is Jesse Anderson, a lead manufacturing engineer at SpaceX, joining you from our headquarters in Hawthorne, California. You're watching a live webcast for our 17th Starlink mission and our second mission of 2021. If you've been following Starlink development, then you know that Starlink is a constellation of multiple satellites that orbit the planet at about 550 kilometers with the potential to service the entire globe. And because they're in a low orbit, the round trip data time between the user and the satellite, also known as latency, is much lower than with satellites in geostationary orbit. This enables Starlink to deliver services like seamless video calls that are usually not possible on other satellite internet services. And because Starlink satellites fly in a global constellation, we can bring high-speed internet to places that previously had terrible service or no service at all. While this is our first Starlink mission of 2021, it is also notable because we are attempting to fly and land a Falcon 9 first stage for the eighth time, a first for Falcon 9. This booster debuted on our Demonstration 1 wow. mission in March of 2019 and then flew again three months later on Radarsat Constellation mission. In 2020, it supported four Starlink missions as well as the SXM-7 mission at the end of the year. And we will be attempting to recover the booster again on our drone ship. Just read the instructions, and that's what you see on your screen. Stationed off the coast of Florida in the Atlantic Ocean. If we are successful, it will mark the 72nd recovery of our Falcon 9 first stage. Falcon 9 was designed for 10 or more flights with minimal refurbishment between each flight. And today's flight gets us closer to that goal. 
Currently, we're at T minus 14 and a half minutes, and all systems are go for an on time liftoff at 8.02 a.m. Eastern Time. Let's take a closer look at the rocket that you see on your screen. You're looking at a live view of Falcon 9, our 70 meter two stage liquid fueled launch vehicle. The chief engineer held a technical pull at T minus one hour, and the launch director held a propellant load and launch go no go pull at T minus 38 minutes. Falcon 9 has been loading propellants since T minus 35 minutes. And currently, our rocket grade kerosene, or RP1, is nearly fully loaded on the first stage, which is the bottom two thirds of the vehicle. The first stage is responsible for accelerating the vehicle through the Earth's atmosphere to the edge of space with the help of nine Merlin engines. Now directly above the first stage is the black carbon fiber interstage, which you can see there at the bottom of your screen. And connected to that is the Falcon 9 second stage. Second stage has a single Merlin vacuum or MVAC engine. And once the first and second stages separate about two and a half minutes into the mission, the MVAC engine will ignite for its first burn and then shut down for coasting. Today, we will be performing two second stage burns and deploying our Starlink satellites at approximately one hour into the mission. The two burns allow us to deploy our satellites into a circular orbit, which in turn helps them get to their final orbit much faster. Now you'll notice this large nose cone at the top of the rocket that you're looking at on your screen. This is called the fairing. That's where the stack of Starlink satellites is safely housed. The fairing protects the satellites from aerothermal heating, aerodynamic loads, and contamination during ascent. As you may know, space is a vacuum, so we will jettison the fairing halves to reduce some weight as the second stage continues. I just want to point out really quick, look at the tents right down there in that shot. Oh. Flight proven fairing halves and Miss Tree and Miss Chief, which you are looking at on your screen, will be attempting to recover them by wet recovery, meaning we will be retrieving them from the water. Now, weather is looking 90% favorable at the launch site, which you can see that beautiful view there uh, with a slight chance of cumulus cloud development this morning. At our recovery site in the Atlantic Ocean, ground level winds are in the forecast today. Now, these winds are potentially stronger than what Falcon 9 has experienced on previous flights. Therefore, today's mission will be what we call an envelope expansion on our first stage landing wind performance meaning we are going to test the wind limits of our vehicle upon landing. Now with that, the vehicle, satellites, weather and range are all looking good for an on-time liftoff just a few minutes from now. Yeah, that one shot. Since our last good. launch in November of 2020, we've brought Starlink to a handful of new communities in the US, Canada, as well as the United Kingdom, which we're really excited to tell you about. In Canada, we signed our first customer, the Pekanjikum First Nation Reservation, which is located in a remote area of Ontario Province, Canada, about 300 kilometers northeast of Winnipeg. The Pekanjikum First Nation are an indigenous community of approximately 2,000 to 3,000 people, representing 400 to 500 family households. The area is so remote that for the majority of the year, all shipments are sent via chartered airplane, except during the coldest weeks when trucks are able to travel across ice roads to reach the community. Given the remote and terrain challenges of the Pekanjikum First Nation, it is cost prohibitive to update or lay new infrastructure. Our Starlinks were delivered to the community for use in residences, community buildings, and businesses. Here's a look at how Starlink is positively impacting the Pekanjikum First Nation Reservation. So yeah, they, they posted this video uh, on Twitter and I think maybe on YouTube too, so if you guys want to watch it, it's actually really cool. Uh, it helps understand the, the importance of this and why it's not just some, you know, we're going to we're gonna blah 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 hippy dippy uh, Silicon Valley like we're gonna save the world of technology it is actually quite impactful so definitely watch that I did want to point out in that shot you can see the tents that they're working on down there so they are still doing some some pad stuff at 39a of course at some point they actually started a super heavy launch pad at 39a but I hadn't seen any progress on that for a while so uh, it, it was curious to see all the extra things out there so I wonder what the tents are doing now I just thought that was kind of curious and worth pointing out um, I also as soon as it's safe to do so I will make sure that I do an orientation check of this rocket I'm sure they're probably waiting on that but meanwhile let's answer a few more guys questions here 
uh, while we have time. Hey, Tim, thanks for waking up early to stream for us. Any idea what happened to the two Raptors that need replacement for SN9? Uh, they got taken out and swapped out, and likely they'll just kind of go through some repair. Uh, I'm guessing that they aren't, like, destroyed. You know, they might just need... You know, who knows what those types of things, you know, changing out valves, changing out some sensors, um, maybe even fixing a bearing or something like that in one of the turbines. Um, it's, uh, it's, yeah, it sounds like uh, Raptor SN44 was taken back to McGregor. So that's, that makes sense. That's where that would get repaired. McGregor's kind of the, you know, that's where all the real engine tech uh, and all the, the people that are really the experts of, of Raptor really live, you know, and, and, and where they fix stuff up a lot. So. Um, yeah, so it, so I'm I'm guessing they're just getting repaired, and then that's why they put new Raptors on there, and hopefully we'll see those things light up as early as today. So we will see, honestly. Um, what do you guys think? Do you think we'll actually see it static fire today? And if so, do you think we'll see it launch uh, soon thereafter? I I'm hoping it launches. Um, no, or at this point, I almost don't want it to be uh, here before Saturday because I do. Uh, I'm currently missing uh, Ryan Jelinski from Cosmic Perspective. He is, uh, he's actually having to cover the Transporter 1 launch in Kennedy Space Center. So I, I don't want it to go until at least two days after Transporter 1 because otherwise I'll be very scared. <laughs> uh, all right, so Miles M. Uh, for Miko, loved your tour of Boca Chica despite the tragic ending. Thank you for everything you do for the community, Tim. Uh, well, thank you very much, Miles. Uh, I'm just happy that we're both, that Andrew and I are both okay. Uh, for those of you that don't know, uh, I'm sure this will probably come up often. But, uh, yeah, we did literally at the exact end of our live stream, basically, uh, quite literally, uh, a car kind of smoked us while we were still in the car. We were just at the edge of the, the highway there, Boca Chica, right at the right at the beachfront, and a car lost control trying to come off the beach and just absolutely just smoked us. So, um, yeah, so Miko, all the airbags went off and everything, and uh, it'll be going in for repairs, which is interesting right now. I've spent, like, way too much time on the phone with insurance because uh, there was an uninsured driver, and they also don't want to tow it uh, up to San Antonio, which is the closest place to repair it. <laughs> so... Uh, it's interesting. So I've had not the best week so far. Uh, so hopefully it gets better and hopefully we actually see a static fire um, today too. So we'll see. Fingers crossed, guys. <laughs> it is so incredible to see the community's excitement and gratitude. And our Starling team is really proud to be able to help communities like the Pekanjikum First Nation Reservation. Also, since our last mission in November, we signed up Marysville, Ohio, as well as the Wise County Public School District in Virginia, which will help bring satellite internet service to almost 50 families in that rural community who otherwise would have limited access to high-speed internet. And lastly, earlier this month, we expanded our Better Than Nothing beta program to include customers across the pond in the United Kingdom. Within the northern U.S. and Canada and now the U.K., we are focused on rural and remote areas where there is no easy access to fiber or cable. If you're interested in our service, head over to Starlink.com for more information. Sweet. This is a good time to do uh, pointy end up, flaming We end are down. currently <laughs> just under T-minus six minutes from liftoff, and Falcon 9 is now moving into the final stages of the countdown. Our next event will be the transporter erector, or TE, retracting slightly away from the vehicle at T minus four and a half minutes. Now, the TE is that large trusted structure that you can see right behind Falcon 9 on your screen. We use the TE to roll the rocket out to the pad and raise it to its vertical launch position. The TE also routes the vehicle's fluids, power, and telemetry umbilicals from the ground systems to the rocket and satellites until Falcon 9 goes on internal power and clears the pad. At liftoff, it will, it will retract even further in order to clear the way for Falcon 9's ascent. Yep. Yeah, like I said, uh Orientation check done, baby. This is a great shot. That pointy end is up. We're that just under 25 seconds away from that TE retraction. You can see those white clouds around Falcon 9 
That's what happens when the uh, LOX hits the ambient air there. Yep, Jesse pretty much nailed it. And, and specifically, it's when the LOX changes phase. It We're warms up going from liquid oxygen to gaseous oxygen. Nice and it vents out. Here. It's still really cold. Comes in contact with the the humidity, you know, the the, va the water vapor in the air, and makes those little condensation clouds. So not not smoke. Those are condensation clouds. Totally normal. No big deal. And it is fun to see, you know, the the first stage of the booster that's been reused, obviously, uh, it's on its for its eighth time now. Uh, it is interesting to see just how dark. It's almost black, but you will see there's some ice, of course, on it in the liquid oxygen tank. So. Uh, it, parts of it look white, the other parts look um, almost black, so just kind of pay attention when we get that other shot. I also yeah, love hearing it breathe, too. The is the top of the vehicle, and that transfer rector should be retracting here soon. And there you can see it on your screen. It looks very slow and very slight, um, but there it is moving back. Now the first and second stages are both nearly fully loaded with one million pounds of kerosene fuel and liquid oxygen. Super chilled liquid oxygen is our propellant oxidizer. And as I just mentioned, it's what's creating those white clouds that you can see right there on your screen. Uh, that happens when it's exposed to the warmer ambient air. First stage should finish prop loading in a second here and second stage at T minus two minutes. At T minus 60 seconds, Falcon 9 is in startup. And what that means is that the rocket's autonomous internal flight computers have taken over the launch countdown. Now they'll light the Merlin engines at about T minus two seconds and liftoff will be commanded at T minus zero. We use TTEB as our ignition fluid and when it mixes with oxygen, it burns a green colored flame. So you might see a green flash uh, near T zero. We then allow fuel into the thrust chamber and the engine comes up to, f to power for liftoff. Now the Starlink payload continues to be healthy. The Falcon 9 team is tracking no issues on the rocket. Weather is looking great as you can see there on your screen. And the range is green for launch. Um, I should point out, I don't think that sound actually was the Falcon 9. I think that's the factory. Uh, but wait, this isn't it. Maybe it is the Falcon 9. I was debating whether or not it was in the background of the voice. And we just passed the two, T minus two minute mark. Species locks close out. And there's that call out that locks load is complete on both first and second stage. Just about 15 seconds or so, we will start venting out the transporter erector liquid oxygen line. There and are, there you can see it on your screen, those white clouds. As I mentioned, this is the venting, just clearing out the line on the transporter erector. Yeah, I... Now in about 15 seconds or so, Falcon 9 will be in startup, and Stage 1 and Stage 2 will begin pressurizing for launch. Falcon 9. There's that call out. Falcon 9 is in startup. Now we're waiting for the go for launch for the from the launch director in a few seconds here. Starlink Falcon 9 LD is go for launch. And there's that call out that we are go for launch this morning. Nice. So at T minus 30 seconds. All systems are go for launch. So let's listen into the terminal count and watch as Falcon 9 takes our Starlink satellites into orbit. Stage one, press for flight. Minus 15 seconds. Falcon 9 is configured for flight. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, 0.
plus 40 seconds. We've got a beautiful view of Falcon 9 successfully lifting yeah, off. The tree is nominal from pad 39A at Kennedy Space Center, carrying our stack of Starlink satellites to orbit. And we are throttling down the vehicle, uh, the engines in preparation for max Q or maximum aerodynamic pressure. This is the largest structural Series load that the vehicle sees on ascent. So slowing down the vehicle helps us pass through the short period. Max Q. And there's that call out that we've passed through mass, max Q. That's a good milestone. Now, in about a minute, we'll have three events happening. That'll be main engine cutoff, or what we call MECO, stage separation, and SES-1, which is second engine start one. Now, MECO is where we shut down all nine of those M1D engines on the first stage to slow the vehicle down in preparation for stage separation. And that's where the first stage separates from the second stage. First stage will start making its way. First stage will start making its way back to Earth for landing, while second stage continues on its journey with the third event, which is SES-1 or second engine start one, and that's where we light up the MVAC engine and it propels the second stage along with these Starlink satellites to orbit. We've just got some awesome views on the screen. Such a beautiful morning. We're just about 15 seconds away from those three events. Miko, stage separation, and SES-1. Yeah, I love when it's pitching, you can see kind of the flames. And looking. Miko. Do it for Miko. Stage separation confirmed. And the ignition and throttle up. All right, so notice we do have the first and there. You just there saw Miko and stage separation on your left hand screen. On your right hand screen is the second stage. We're waiting on fairing deploy coming up here shortly. Fairing separation confirmed. And there you could see the fairing halves have been deployed and you could see them falling back to Earth. And with that stage separation, that confirms the eighth successful flight for this Falcon 9 booster on ascent. So very exciting. Um, and as a reminder, we will be attempting to recover the fairing halves today with our recovery ships, Miss Tree and Miss Chief. So fun reminder, the telemetry that we have provided for you is from flightclub.io. It is simulated telemetry. It looked like the altitude is a, a little bit off. It looks like they flew a little bit shallower profile today. Um, now as stage two heads towards its targeted drop-off orbit, stage one will execute two burns in order to make its way back to Earth. And that first burn is called the entry burn. That's where three of the nine M1D engines will reignite. And this helps. A signal Bermuda. This helps to slow the stage down as it re-enters into the upper parts of the Earth's atmosphere. The second and final burn for the first stage is the landing burn. Each of the M1D engines has 190,000 pounds of thrust, which is just enough to slow down the vehicle rapidly to touch down for landing, as the landing burn is just a single engine burn. And again, this is the vehicle's eighth flight, so it is our life leader. It has completed a successful ascent and stage separation, so let's see if we can land it for the eighth time, which will be a first for Falcon 9. So you do see it starting to come back Both down. Both vehicles are following nominal trajectories. Booster is coming back Remember down. that call out that both vehicles are nominal. So it was arcing like this, and when it let go, it was still going up. So Just a little over a up. minute away from that entry burn start on the first stage. I do want to point out a few things that we get asked often. And what do you see on your screen? Um, there's is a lot of ice uh, coming off of the first stage. You can actually see it falling off there. The um, but a lot of times the ice will just kind of pop off and, and just kind of get, stage. you know, see it fly by. It's just kind of going in all directions, you know, because they're all moving screen, relative to each other. So you'll see little bits of ice uh, coming off of the first stage, flying by the camera. 
Uh, unfortunately, they aren't aliens. Uh, they're definitely not UFOs, though, because uh, they're identifiable. They're chunks of ice, so they're not an unidentified flying object. Uh, so, yeah, you will see little bits of ice falling off of the booster often because, remember, again, it was quite literally a sheet of ice, basically, at takeoff on the liquid oxygen tank. You'll also see that happening on the second stage. You'll see pieces flying off. Again, still ice chunks from the second stage. And you'll also see the second stage doing little little things happening to that the thermal blanket. Um, and, and those are the little, the little puffs of they also have they have gas thrusters on the left on the booster like you're seeing right now the but they also have that on the on the upper stage so let's listen in here and see we're getting ready for that entry burn of the first stage stage one entry burn startup there's that call out and visual of the entry burn on the first stage on your left hand screen so it lasts about 20 seconds long yeah, it looks like Declan's data on this one is not very accurate. Stage one, entry burn, shut down. And that concludes the entry burn on first stage. And as a reminder, at our recovery site in the Atlantic Ocean, ground level winds are in the forecast today. These winds are potentially stronger than what Falcon 9 has experienced on all, all trajectories. I, think it's I was just to call out that everything is nominal. Uh, these winds are potentially stronger than what Falcon 9 has experienced on previous flights. Therefore, today's mission will be what we call an envelope expansion on our first stage landing wind performance, meaning we're going to test the wind limits of our vehicle upon landing. So let's see if we can stick this landing today. Again, it also wow. will be the eighth landing if we do land this vehicle. Wow. Okay. And so we're just about 30 seconds away from that landing burn start on the first stage. And what you're looking at on your screen is a nice view of the second stage. So this might Still not Still looking land, nominal. Guys. We might see a, a crash landing here. If they're, if they're pushing the envelope, we just don't know the, you know the results there. So get ready, they're gonna be doing that landing burn here very soon. Yeah, we'll probably as well. Stage one, landing burn startup. There's that call out. Landing burn has started on first stage. Let's see if we could Thermal stick guidance. this landing. There's a view of the drone ship on your left hand screen. Oh, what's that? Was that just a stage one thing? landing leg deploy? Okay. <laughs> I was like, what is that? Oh, oh. Looks like we lost that live view on the first stage. We'll wait for confirmation. And oh. there you can see on your screen, we have landed the Falcon 9 for the eighth time. This is our life leader. What an amazing morning. That is an awesome view. And we're just waiting for Seco 1 on second stage. Wow. And Seco. Wow. And there's that call out for Seco 1. Waiting for confirmation of good orbit. How do they do that? Dang, that is awesome. They... Nominal insertion. And there's that call out for good orbit on second stage. What an exciting morning. We've landed that first stage for the eighth time. And now that second stage is going to coast. A signal to Finland. Second stage is now going to coast in this orbit for the next 35 minutes or so. And while that happens, take a look at this. Uh, the animation will have an animation showcasing where we are in the coast phase. So we'll, be, we'll see you back here at T plus 45 minutes for that second stage relay. Sweet. All right. That is awesome. Honestly, I, yeah, pushing that booster to the limits and it still sticks the landing. I mean, that's awesome. So they basically... Well, envelope expansion means is they normally have like limits of like, hey, we're not going to exceed, you know, maybe this amount of wind here, or you know, you could even do it um, for how much margin you have. This this sounded like is is primarily just wind in the in the landing, uh, but they they did push it. You could tell that it was windy. You could see some big waves, um, but you could all, sometimes do envelope expansion even for like, hey, we're going to see, you know, if we can use even less fuel than we normally do for a landing burn, and things like that. So. Uh, this was envelope expansion of, of how much wind it could take, basically, uh, at the landing site. Still knocked it out of the park. 
no big deal. I mean, that's that's impressive, impressive stuff. Uh, dang, SpaceX. So eighth flight for that for that booster. That is awesome. Uh, real quick, just while we're getting started or while we're waiting here, between we've got quite a while before the second engine burn. Uh, I did want to mention that we do have normal shirts today. Everything looked normal. As, of course, we have people that don't know exactly what that means and why it's normal. Uh, it was uh, something that John Innsbrucker uh, said once, one of the SpaceX hosts uh, and engineers. Um, if I remember right, principal engineer of, like, quality engineer, principal engineer of Falcon 9 or so something like that. Um, but, yeah, he uh, he one time mixed up the words norm uh, nominal, which means that everything's, you know, going as planned, and normal. And he said nominal forever kind of coining the term nominal. So if you do want to support what I do, uh, consider going to everydayastronaut.com slash shop and uh, pick up some cool merch. But it, this this shirt in particular and the nominal hat are 10% off today by using coupon code launch day. That's all one word, lowercase, launch day. Uh, you will get 10% off of the nominal merch, so you can find that under apparel. And, uh, and then any of the, the nominal, uh, the shirt or the hat, uh, yeah, at, at check out to supply uh, nominal, and you will find it there. So uh, thanks to all of those of you that do support via getting some fun merch. So, yeah, it means a lot. All right, let's get back to some of you guys' comments. So uh, let's see here. We've got... Um, Andres says, go to sleep fun. Thanks for all your content. Thank you very much, Andres. <laughs> I need it. I need it. Uh, this is Bill uh, says, my contribution to Miko towing fee. Well, thank you very much, Bill. Um, hopefully, we shouldn't have to fundraise <laughs> or feel sympathy for a car accident. That should be exactly what insurance is for. Um, unfortunately, they're giving me a bit of a runaround here. But, um, yeah, we'll see. <laughs> This is from uh, Matthew Duggar. Sleep more, Tim. Fund. Good morning from Waco. Hey, how's it going, Waco? You guys just got snow like last week. That was kind of wild. I mean, that's very rare, I feel like. At least that much snow. It was substantial. Uh, it's from staff. Hey, Tim. Um, been feeling pretty lonely during lockdown. Not going to lie. Thanks heaps for all these streams, brother. I love watching with you and the whole community. That is awesome, staff. We do love to hear that. And um, I, I, I feel like I'm just... Uh, preaching to the choir here and saying this often but that's that is one of the things that i just absolutely love about space flight um yeah we uh it's you know that's that's the great thing is that we're, we're all here to cheer for things uh together and we're here to celebrate you know human humanity going out and exploring space and it just is something to look forward to it is something to wake up and get excited about it's something to keep our mind off of especially you know in 2020 and as we still progress uh, in 2021 we've had some things that it's just nice to take your mind off of some of the other things and be excited about something so yeah um parker says uh you ever been uh you ever been to america space museum in titusville best museum i've been to in my whole life and they honestly need some internet help i've actually never been there i don't even know about the american space museum wow they must need some help if i don't know about them I will definitely check that out next time out at the Cape. And yeah, um, yeah, that's awesome. Uh, Masaki says, good morning, Tim. Usually at the Cape for launches, but today 72 miles away. Uh, and I'll still be able to see from Haines City. Glad you guys are okay, by the way. Thank you very much, Masaki. I'm, yeah, uh, you could, 72 miles away, you definitely hopefully saw it. <laughs> definitely hopefully. Hopefully definitely maybe saw it. Uh, yeah, that's, that's awesome. Uh, that's great dedication there. Uh, Jonathan uh, Hinchliff says uh, no barrel sections yet on for uh, seal number 12 through 14. Uh, these are starships. And then asking lunar starships? Question mark. No. Nope, nope, nope. They're just skipping uh, 12 through 14 and going right to 15. This is a whole... I've been saying this for a while. Their production rate was way ahead of their launch rate, right? So even though they are learning lessons still uh, as they're flying starships, they already had hardware that was built and done and might be old hardware at this point you know so serial number 15 elon mentioned a long time ago is kind of their first big iterative step and they're getting closer to like orbital flight or orbital hardware so we're seeing 15 actually in the mid bay uh and they're just skipping 12 13 14 they had a couple parts put out but they're likely swapping materials they might be going to that thinner stainless steel maybe uh as Hopefully soon, actually, we'll probably see serial number 7.2, so the actual test tank, uh, that's going to be using 3 millimeter steel instead of 4 millimeter steel. Um, and 
yeah, so there's a chance that we actually see that happen uh, really soon. And I think that might be one of the big changes that Signal Number 15 has. So they're going to be, um, you know, they're going to be actually testing it before they, they test Signal Number 15. I, I'm surprised they didn't test it before they built Signal Number 15, though. But that's kind of the whole thing is uh, that's why they're not doing 12, 13, 14. Is it just has old hardware. So we're seeing 15 already in the mid bay getting ready to to awaiting it's, it's time to fly so that's awesome jared says morning from spokane washington thank you very much jared how's it going then thank you for saying hi uh ben roberts hi tim thank you for your videos they definitely saved me from madness in the last uh years lockdown keep it up also will falcon heavy ever fly again yes falcon heavy is slated um to fly this year um uh, up up to maybe i think it could fly three times i don't think that's very likely if i remember right i think it's for sure once, and that'll be in the first half of the year. Um, and then I don't, uh, then there are two other times that it's supposed to fly, but, um, oh, Trevor says it could fly four times. Holy crap. I thought it was two or three. Uh, yeah, so there's USS F-44, USS F-52, uh, and then two more. So yeah, Falcon Heavy is gonna be back at it this year. Um, yeah, which is which is awesome because we didn't see anything in 2020 from Falcon Heavy. Maybe that's why, maybe that's one of the reasons why 2020 was so hard and just such a bad year because we didn't have any Falcon Heavies. Maybe Falcon Heavy is the the savior that we all need to to make a uh, make the year great. Um, Philip Moyer, the Raptor production cycle seems to be the Starship build uh, gating factor. Any rumors about how SpaceX is managing engine production and attempting to increase the output? Well, let me tell you just kind of from my own experience. So. Um, Starship right now, when, when you're just doing the prototypes and they're flying about every, you know, we'll say, we'll say they'll be flying once a month. You need to have, you know, hopefully they start landing them and they can reuse Raptors over and over and they don't have to waste them like on, not waste them, but you know, we don't see loss of Raptors like CL number eight, but soon they'll be getting to the point where, you know, they, they're landing these Starships, uh, the prototypes as they're, as they're practicing maneuvers and pushing them to the limits. And we'll see Raptors that survive, but for now, you really only need to make three a month. And I bet their production is right around three a month now, two to three a month. Um, that's They're all still being built in Hawthorne. And Hawthorne definitely is like almost out of space. Uh, in my opinion, it, it really seems more and more like Hawthorne should be able to focus more on Dragon and Falcon 9 and Merlin. Uh, the kind of their, you know, their bread and butter right now. Keep cranking those things out. But I would not be at all surprised if we see either a huge massive expansion for Raptor out there so they can produce a ton of Raptors. We're talking, they'll have to produce, uh, you know, more like once a week, even faster than that. If we want to see an orbital super heavy, that Raptor production ramp will have to increase substantially. Because think about this right now, let's pretend that every seal number out there, the ones that are about to fly. So we have obviously nine has some Raptors. Two of them are being <laughs> repaired right now uh, that they, they stole some Raptors from seal number 10. So let's say, let's just say that all of them are taken care of, 9, 10, 11, and 15. All of those have Raptors set aside. I don't know if that's the case or not. Um, but then, in order to go to orbit, uh, well, first off, each booster is going to, when they test, they're probably going to do a, a booster or two that is going to be just kind of little suborbital test hops and stuff like that. Uh, Elon has mentioned that on Twitter. And then in order to go orbital, they're going to need around two dozen engines minimum to really do an orbital mission. Maybe they can maybe do like 20, but let's just say 24. And let's say they also need six uh, Raptors on Starship. That's still 30 Raptor engines. Even if they produce them at two a month right now, I don't think they'll have enough Raptors to even get to orbit by the end of the year, period. Um, it is a limitation. And I know it's surprising to me because Gwen Shotwell, who, you know, obviously president of SpaceX, the, she's the, reason that spacex makes money and and is still kicking butt um she does think that they'll actually get to orbit in q3 with starship i'll be shocked honestly i'll be shocked we'll, we'll see we'll see uh if, if that's the case i feel like raptor production might be the big hold up so um, that and then of course the orbital pad has to be complete and in order for the orbital pad to be complete it also means a new tank farm like there has to be a tank farm able to support super heavy uh think about the tank farm now just for starship now think about doubling the amount of production and doubling, or not production, but doubling the amount of um, tankage there for a super heavy booster. So we'll have to see a huge production farm. Sorry, I keep saying production. They are actually working on their ASU, their air separator unit. 
uh, which is awesome. So they can actually build liquid oxygen on site or, or capture it out of the air on site and then uh, fill up the tank. So we're going to have to see twice the amount of tankage out there. We'll have to see the orbital pad ready and complete. And then, uh, and then we'll have to see around at like 20 plus Raptor engines for the first orbital flight. That's going to be, those are some big milestones. We'll see if that actually does happen this year. Uh, this is from Hanalock. What's the final reuse number for Falcon 9? Well, they're designed for 10 flights. Uh, this is obviously the eighth flight of this particular booster. So we will see. Um, yeah, uh, I, I think they can obviously hit 10. I, they obviously were starting to push this one a little bit more than they normally would. So they're starting to feel like they got most of the life out of the booster probably. Uh, we'll see if they fly it two more times or not. But they are designed for 10 flights. And it seems like they didn't even static fire this one. So it seems like they're feeling more and more. They're feeling quite confident about it. So. Uh, this is from uh, Ligues. says, uh, thanks for not sleeping. You're welcome. I can't wait to go back to sleep. <laughs> uh, from Chris Big Bad, um, hello. Can we please agree to call Starlink launches a heat? <laughs> Cheers from Germany. Thanks for the show. Well, I feel like all rockets really are, are just a big, a big giant yeet. Um, but, yeah, I, I feel like... I feel like Starlink launches don't don't deserve that title any more or less than any other launches, uh, but I will I will absolutely agree to every launch being a yeet. <laughs> Thank you so much, uh, Paul Finley. Uh, hi Tim, Paul here from Ireland, first time caller, long time listener. Uh, what do you expect to see? When do you expect to see Falcon and retired, if ever? Um, I think it'll have a, a quite a lifespan still uh, with NASA, specifically for crew. I think it could even fly for crew. Uh, long after its its commercial uses have kind of gone away. So I think, well, crew and cargo resupply, um, I could see that happening all, all the way through the 20s. I think there'll be Falcon 9 and Dragon all the way through uh, until like 2030. Uh, even if Starship does fly and, and become operational and orbital, it'll be servicing commercial and eventually government contracts rather quickly. But I don't. I don't. Th I think it'll be a while before it's doing anything with the ISS or doing anything um, with humans on it. So we will see. Uh, that's kind of that's kind of my guess is the Falcon Nine will probably retire around 2030. Just a total guess there, uh, because it will be it will be pretty much obsolete as soon as Starship flies. But there's also still uh, a lot of certification and things that it can do currently with humans and and cargo that that uh, it'll be a while before Falcon Nine gets there too. So we'll see. Um, ET uh, Eddie Conia, uh, if this booster reaches retirement in one piece, I hope they donate to the Smithsonian Air and Space. Seems appropriate for such a pioneering vehicle. I hope that we just see more of the boosters at different museums. Period. Uh, it, it's it's a shame to not have them on, uh, you know, completely on display. Space Center Houston did a really good job of displaying their Falcon 9 that they got donated. They they displayed it horizontally, so you can actually get right up underneath it. I think that's super cool. I definitely want to see more of that. I, I would love to see one out at the, you know, California Science Center, the Smithsonian's, uh, you know, the Air and Space Museum. It would probably have to be at the one out by the airport, by Dulles Airport, and not uh, downtown or on the mall because there's just no room in the mall for a Falcon 9 unless you hung it, like, down the hallway. Or, I don't even know. I don't know what they would do, but that, that would be awesome too, though. Uh, from Roman, uh, thank you so much for the emoji. I appreciate it. Uh, Joey headed to space. Uh, it says, morning, Tim. Can't thank you enough for what you do. Headed to Boca Chica in the morning to see Starship. Would be sweet to meet and greet. Uh, unfortunately, Joey, we're not doing any meet and greets right now because of uh, the pandemic still. We're staying uh, as isolated as possible in our hotel room. So uh, we really only go out to set up cameras and occasionally do some carry out and things like that. Um, as, soon as, as soon as things are safe, I will be doing some meetups and stuff like that too. Uh, but today for Starship, you know, we might see a static fire today. Uh, and who knows, maybe we'll actually see it fly soon. But with Starship, you just never know. You just literally never, ever know. Uh, from Midwest Nerd, uh, do you dip cinnamon rolls in your chili? No, that's both of those things sound. No. Is that a thing? Do people dip cinnamon rolls in chili? That sounds insanely wrong to me. For some reason, cinnamon rolls. I don't, I don't love cinnamon rolls, and I don't really love chili, so I, I don't combine those two. <laughs> I'm sorry to say. Uh, how's it going? Uh, Own hi. How's it going? Uh, once we have colonized Mars, will that change the phrase, a world's first? Is a world's first on Earth uh, applicable to Mars? So being like, 
This is the world's first. I feel like we use that kind of generally as humanity's first, you know, or the first time in history. Um, but world's first, I guess it's still, it could be plural, worlds and then apostrophe. Um, I don't know. That's, yeah, that's, that's actually a pretty good question. I'm not sure what that'll look like when we are multiplanetary. Um, that's something fun to think about. This is from uh, uh, Ad Abhijit uh, Anand. Sorry if I absolutely butchered your name. Uh, just so, just so that you butcher my name. All the best, Miko. <laughs> well, thank you. I absolutely did. I'm sure. Uh, but thank you for <laughs> for the challenge because I'm 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 normally always bad at reading, and then on, on no sleep, I'm I'm even worse at reading. So thank you very much, uh, Mark Small. Winnipeg is in Manitoba, not. Um, Ontario. I'm surprised that SpaceX would get this wrong on stream. Best of luck with Miko Tim. Well, thank you very much, Mark. Um, interesting. Yeah, I uh, definitely don't know my geography, so I'm glad that you pointed that out. But yeah, it could have just been a simple, simple mistake. I'm sure it's not like you know. Sometimes they just write a script really quick uh, for the hosts. It's not like everyone at SpaceX doesn't know this or whatever. But maybe just a a quick little little mistake. But yeah. Uh, Thank you very much from Fubo44. I'm glad we're okay too. I just have a few bruises from airbags, um, but that's it. Otherwise, Andrew's completely fine. Uh, yeah, we're, we're just lucky that we were still in the car because if we had just gotten out of the car, uh, we could have got very seriously injured. That car was going pretty darn fast. So, yeah. Um, Andreas T. Um, hey, Tim, just got an invitation for an apprenticeship at a space company in Germany. Team Space, keep up the, the good work. Wow, Andres, that is awesome to hear. Uh, yeah, that's that's fantastic. I, I love hearing that. Uh, hopefully you, you learn a lot, and hopefully you, uh, yeah, you just this is just the start of your, your space ambitions. That is very, very cool. Uh, I'd be curious to know what which aerospace company it is, but that is awesome. Uh, Plaid Walker says, good morning, Tim. Are the fairings under under vacuum and is it a, a concern while separating them from the rocket no so the fairings uh this is a good question the fairings actually are basically at ambient pressure they actually have some valves that that relief so at sea level they're the payload and the inside of the fairings are at sea level pressure and then as it goes up they intentionally vent out and and try to kind of match ambient temperature now they bleed a little bit slower and they prevent some spikes so there's some some things there some tools in play to make sure that they don't um you know, like at max Q and stuff like that, that they don't have um, just big pressure spikes and, and do any damage to the payload on the inside of the fairing. So, um, yeah, they, um, they, they're, they although they look like just kind of a big, dumb piece of, you know, fairing, they're, they are smart and there's a, they're actually like obviously really important, but there's actually some, some interesting engineering there too. So, um, Bram Nada, so sad to hear about Miko, but very glad you're both okay. Yes, that's, again, that's what matters the most, and we're, we are both totally fine. So thank you very much, Bram. Um, this is from Lars. Uh, let's let's go for Miko, both car and for Falcon 9. Yeah, look. I, I forgot that, yeah, I, I do currently have one of the aero covers. Just we stuck it on the wall, because why not? Um, while, uh, while it's going to be in the shop for quite a while, I'm sure. <laughs> uh, super, super cleary photo. Um, envelope fund. <laughs> I don't even. I love it. Perfect. Thank you very much, Super Clearly Photo. Um, Andy Mian says that uh, twas a nice bullseye on that landing. I still can't believe that. Yep, pushing it to the limits, and they make it look like no big deal at all. Um, Honey Lock, let's go. Fal let's go for Falcon Nine, or let's go for Nine Falcon Nine. Uh, love the stream so far. Well, thank you very much, Honey Lock. Yeah, you're right. They should actually be going. It'd be awesome. Uh, that'd be really fun to see a, a Falcon 9 booster fly for the ninth time. It would live up to its name of Falcon 9. Absolutely. That's very cool. Sam Thomas, love your work. Uh, your work has been a great motivation during the pandemic. We're all in. Keep it up. Love from India. Well, thank you very much, Sam. Uh, yeah. That's awesome. I, that's like I, It has been fun that the that the aerospace industry was extremely busy last year. You know, So um, it's just fun to think that even during a pandemic, uh, it wasn't really... a that big of a deal that they were still taking care of business and giving us something to look forward to uh jeffrey martin para character thank you so much for the uh the emoji i appreciate that paul says hello there just wondering if you plan to upgrade your vehicle after the collision glad you guys are okay looking forward to see sn9 this week um i'm definitely looking forward to see sn9 um i don't i i, I do want a longer range vehicle um 
that a little bit longer range because I when I do road trips often, especially in the cold in the winter, um, I I would love just a little bit more. It, it's no problem for me to to get down here. Uh, you know, I've put uh, about fifty thousand miles, so uh, eighty thousand kilometers on it already in, in just over two years. And a lot of that's you know been down to Florida in it like four or five times. I've been down to Texas here, uh, again four or five or six times. I don't even remember now. Uh, so I have driven it a lot on the highway, but I would still love just a little bit more range. You know, a good 25% more for uh, that's actually a lot of range, but uh, you know, 25% more or so on these long road trips would help a lot and just make it a little bit easier, make my my travel just a little bit easier. So I would like to upgrade at some point. I wasn't planning on it anytime soon. I'm focusing on trying to get um, a South, uh, some kind of, you know, Mars Studio or Studio B down here, uh, working on some solutions, but we will see. We will see if any of them work out. Uh, but yeah, thank you very much. Uh, Real Foggy says, I hate dealing with insurance. We pay so much for uh, so much hassle. Here's $10 for the frustration and for sacrificing your sleep for us. Well, thank you, Real Fro Foggy. Uh, the I think I said froggy earlier, uh, but yeah, the the biggest pain for me is just the the time that it's going to take to actually get this all figured out. Like I've already been on the phone with insurance for hours at this point now, uh, with very little things figured out. Plus, uh, once the car gets towed to San Antonio, five hours away, at some point I'm going to have to go up five hours to get the car. It's just it's just so there's a day gone. You know, there's ten hours in the car um, to go up there and back. It's just not fun you know not not what i want to be working on or thinking about right now when we're so busy with s9 stuff so um yeah uh brant in our discord does want to know if we have the footage from tesla cameras uh we do not have the footage from the tesla cameras because they actually lock it into an internal memory to make sure that it's safe as opposed to just trying to record onto the external um, usb drive so i need to request that footage from tesla uh, but because I, I pulled the card out and the exact minute of, of the crash is actually not there. So, um, yeah, I, I, I'll, I'll be getting that footage from them. Uh, Mike Wolf, uh, Wolfson wanted to get, get a mug, $20 shipping to, uh, European union, any fix. Uh, we do, that's unfortunate. We do actually have a new shipping system and, uh, it, it does take into account your local VAT and the shipping costs and everything. And, uh, Unfortunately, that, that might just be the way it is. Right now, by the way, uh, I definitely need to tamp you if you are in the UK. or spe uh, Yeah, I, specifically if you're in uh, a part of Britain and you're in, in Brexit, bad news. Um, there's a lot higher shipping costs now and a lot higher taxes, like insane taxes. It's something like if you don't spend... This is, this is not my rules. This is what you guys came up with. It's something like... Uh, if you spend, you have to spend 125 uh, pounds. Otherwise, it's you tack on 20% VAT just uh, through the door, right? So it's, which just seems really backwards. I don't know, but um, but yeah. So now, unfortunately, the store going to Britain is is, and then of course we have to pay extra just so our our carrier and our the service that we use has to do some weird accounting now to be able to take in the thing and pay the, all the stuff. So I'm probably gonna be likely losing money on some of those shipping costs and all that stuff now um so that that was not ideal but um yeah we've tried and we've made big big improvements in my opinion but it's still the the pandemic has screwed up shipping costs period so um yeah all right um from jake curry uh hey tim hello from the other waco uh in kansas interesting have you ever been to the Cosmosphere in, in Hutchinson, Kansas? I have not yet. Even a whole SR-71 hanging out in the lobby. I know. I need to see it. I, I drive relatively close to it. I definitely need to see it. And, uh, yeah. Um, I, I, yeah. I'll, I'll do that someday for sure. I, I guarantee it. Uh, Graham W., did you send John, uh, did you send John A., uh, or maybe John I., in, in, uh, wait, John A., did you send John A. had and t-shirt oh a hat sorry there we go uh no i i never sent him a hat or a t-shirt um i don't know if somebody did or, or what the exact story is there uh the one that he originally had on the desk was the person that that was from the person that uh gave us the design for the hat so um i don't think that i think that was pre our store having the hat uh and that was from that same person that that did that with us so um yeah 
Uh, I don't know for sure, but I do think he does have a shirt. So, um, but we didn't. I, I didn't give that to him or anything. Uh, but I do want to interview him. I really want to interview him. I think he'd have some awesome stories. Tech controls. Thanks for the coverage, Tim. Uh, do you think in an extreme emergency, cargo dragging can be used for a quick jump out of ISS? Could life support be provided somehow? Obviously, this is just a worst case scenario. Uh, it doesn't have any life support. Uh, using it as a lifeboat would be an extreme use case. I mean, bleh, like maybe there's some weird way that you could put on like a, uh, you know, a EVA suit and go for re-entry. I, I, I mean, it's just one of those, uh, you know, it takes four hours to suit up. So if there's really an emergency, that's the thing. They always keep, you know, multiple crafts on, on station. So you do have a backup. Uh, you know, there's always more basically more more vehicles to be able to get you down than, than you need uh so I, I just can't imagine the need to try to squeeze into a, a cargo dragon in order to get home safely i i just i i don't think that there would ever be a use case or a situation where that where that would happen but it's fun to think about t-town joe uh making you think more about model s plaid thought of a name well if if i do get it whenever i get an, another tesla that one will be named seco of course because this first one was miko main engine cutoff second one will be second engine cutoff and of course if you didn't notice the pun there there is no engine the engine has been cut off so there's electric motors so that's kind of always been the joke with miko but um yeah that's always been the plan has been number two would be seco uh ben oh and, and t-town I, I would love to have a plaid i don't know uh it seems like that will be rather expensive, but we will see. I would love to get that. That range and those specs would be absolutely bonkers. That would be just ridiculous. Uh, thank you very much, Ben uh, Sanford. I, I do appreciate that. Uh, from Fogsy12, uh, you can bet a lot of money I will be there for every Falcon Heavy launch this year. That is awesome. I, I got to see a Falcon Heavy again for sure. Um, I hope that by the time... I don't know about by the time that the first one launches, but hopefully by the time the second one launches and stuff like that, some of this stuff down here is cleared up. Because I do also want to prioritize Starship because it is, I feel like it is history. It is something that's really unique, and uh, I want to take advantage of, of what we have here, the access that we have here. Um, so, yeah, we'll, we'll see. Um, Ryan Robar says, hey, Tim, is there a better way to send you uh, one-time contributions than a super chat? I'm already a Patreon supporter, but like to help the efforts to cover the SN9 launch without YouTube taking 30%. Um, good question, Ryan. We a lot of people are still recommending. Um, I don't remember what it is now. Uh, some kind of chat. Yeah, like Streamlabs donations. Um, I, I still haven't done anything like that. I, I think you, you, I guess PayPal. Uh, I don't even know what my PayPal me thing is though. But uh, yeah, uh, you know I. I don't know. I mean, if you're already a Patreon supporter, you're already doing your part. So I, I really appreciate that sentiment, though, Ryan. Um, I promise that, you know, it is the, the Patreon supporters that, that make this stuff happen. So, yeah. Um, from 26 Dimensions, uh, do you think one day the Falcon 9 will use methane? Nope. Absolutely not. That would be an entirely different rocket. It would be uh, – it would require a, a different, you know, points for um, for the actual – the bulkheads and, and all that stuff. But it requ would require a different engine. You you probably could do some tooling and, and make some pump changes and stuff and make the Merlin run on methane at some point. But, yeah, they they, will, they don't want to invest another dime into the Falcon 9 um, any more than necessary at all because, obviously, uh, they're, they're putting everything into Starship. So once Starship is online, every dollar that you spent trying to upgrade the Falcon 9 would be wasted because there's just way more potential with Starship. So... Um, nope, we will never see a Falcon 9 use methane. Although there was talks for a little bit about using a Raptor engine as an upper stage, um, but that got scratched. So, yeah. Um, but, nope. Uh, Dario says, if uh, velocity decreases, the larger the orbit gets, and the ISS travels at 28 kilometers an hour and 400 kilometers, how come stage 2 is 27,000 uh, kilometers and 200 kilometers? Um... I think you answered your own question there because um, the velocity decreases the larger the orbit. So, yeah, if the ISS travels at 28 kilometers an hour and it's at 400 kilometers, how come stage two is at 27? And, oh, I see. You're saying... Uh, let's see here. I'm trying to think about why that would be. 27,000. Is that how... 
Hmm. Yeah, I do always say 28. It's 17,500 miles per hour, 2 kilometers an hour. It's about 28,000 kilometers an hour. Yep. So that's what I that's what I always say. But, um, but yeah, the, the elliptical part of it shouldn't change. Oh, yeah, maybe that is it, actually. That that probably is it. At, at, what was it at, at Miko? Or at Seiko? Um, can somebody in Discord just kind of double check what what how fast it was going at Seiko? So right now, if it's at its apogee or near its apogee uh, currently, which it is probably because it's coming up on on Seiko too, so it's going to do its injection. So because it's coasting up to that point, uh, which is pretty close to the same altitude, it obviously needs to speed up once it gets there, and so that will be the injection that gets it up to that same relatively same velocity. So this this will be probably you know a, a uh, a thousand meter per, per second, or not meters per second. Okay, there we go. Uh, it's still only twenty seven thousand one hundred eighty six. That seems. It does seem slow. Hmm, that's a good question. Um, oh, the ISS goes twenty seven thousand six hundred, but still, you'd think. At no point in the flight profile, then, should it be slower than twenty thousand. 27,600 kilometers an hour. Hmm. That is... I actually don't know how that could be. Because that's... Yeah, orbital mechanics would not really allow for that. That's... Maybe the telemetry is not quite... I, I have no idea. Uh, well, I'll see if I can figure that out. But that... Dario... Yeah, that's... Um, well, even if it's not perigee, if it's, at a, if it's 168 kilometers and 27,000 kilometers an hour... I don't care where it's at in the orbit. That if it's orbital, that should be. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah, but it should. Even if it gets further, like as it increases, it, it could slow down. As the altitude increases, it'll slow down. Yep. Yeah. But at at apogee or at, at perigee, which is right there at engine cutoff, um, it should be. Yeah, I don't know. It should be fast. It should be substantially faster than something at a circular 400 kilometer orbit. We need Declan in here. Actually, it should be it should be faster at any point in the orbit. Uh, no, not at not at apogee. It would be slower at apogee, but it should be faster at periapsis. Hmm, peri. I mean, 168 kilometers. Hmm. Interesting. We'll we'll see if we can figure it out. Um, no, it's an elliptical orbit right now. But it's yeah, it's also not. Well, I'm sure it is normal. I'm just trying to figure out how. Right now, though, it's an it's a parking orbit. Even if it's a parking orbit, it means its apogee is not all the way up to that. 300 some kilometers um hmm i'm trying to figure out how, what mechanism and how that could be all right but uh w we'll see um eag cuber uh think about how wonderful it would be to fly from florida to london in the same time as a falcon 9 in just 20 minutes also uh get tim to his mars studio well thank you very much uh yeah that would be insane i can't wait for point to point um, that would be awesome. That would be absolutely amazing. Oh, Flo has a good point. It could be the reference is the ground and not the orbit speed. That could be. I feel like the... Yeah. I feel like that that could be. The difference between ground tracked, your frame of reference, it, it could it could matter on that. Um, yeah. Uh, Benjamin says, uh, uh, read the world's first message. What on earth is going to have to change? Yeah, that'll be hard to, to get out of the language. It'll be like, what on earth? What on earth just happened? And it'll be like, what on Mars just happened? That'll honestly be kind of nuts. Um, from Jacob says, uh, did you know that this is the fastest turnover of a booster? 38 days, of course. Yep, we, we mentioned that in our pre-launch preview. 
We had an on-time liftoff this morning at 8.02 a.m. Eastern Time, followed by the completion of the first eighth flight and recovery for this booster, which is a first for Falcon 9, and despite those stronger winds. Today marks our 65th landing of Falcon 9 and 72nd successful recovery of a first stage. We're now just waiting for the relight of our second stage, or SES-2, coming up here in a few seconds. It'll be a short one second burn. Just waiting for that call out. Again, it's just a one second burn, so it's very quick, but it does go a long way for the second stage. Nominal orbit insertion. And there we heard that call out for good nominal insertion. Again, we just had SES-2 and SECO-2, uh, just a quick burn of that second uh, stage engine. We have another 15-minute coast phase before we deploy our next batch of satellites into orbit. And during this time, the spacecraft will start to spin along its central axis, giving the Starlink satellites the momentum they need to space themselves out over time after they deploy. While this happens, sit back and enjoy the space jams. We'll see you back here at T plus one hour and four minutes. Sweet. All right, so that's good. They are now in a uh, normal, uh, or a nominal, this one actually, but yeah, nominal orbital insertion. So uh, we still do see that it's, it's showing as, as under 27,000 uh, kilometers. So yeah, and they did, <laughs> Jesse did just say space jams. That's it, everyone. I guess tonight we all have to watch Space Jam, starring Michael Jordan. Uh, so yeah, so yes, we we definitely uh, knew that there was a thirty eighth, uh, thirty eight day turnaround, thanks to Trevor Sesnick and uh, uh, for tracking all that stuff. So absolutely. Uh, hang on, I'm double checking here. Expect a loss of signal, it's Diego Garcia. Uh, I'm double checking the work. We're still trying to figure out that people are talking in Discord about uh, the exact. Uh, the exact velocities and all that stuff. Adrian says, um, hey, Tim, love the idea of, a lo of the Lunar Gateway. Any chance you can tell us more about it? Maybe even a future video. Uh, you know, I don't know if I love the idea of a Lunar Gateway. I feel like it doesn't honestly make that much sense still. Um, I get the idea of kind of a reusable, um, almost treating it like a reusable like service module or something in, in orbit of the moon, but... I just don't see that much of a purpose, honestly. I'd rather, I personally would rather see just stuff go direct, you know, direct to the moon, uh, get into a non-rectilinear halo orbit or a polar orbit or something, and then just go from this, if it's Orion, go from Orion to the lunar lander and just right to the surface and not have to do a weird rectilinear halo orbit and also not do, uh, because of that, you also, uh, yeah, yeah, and then rendezvous with just this, this, space station out there i mean i think the idea of a space station out there is cool but almost forcing it into the mission planning does not make any sense to me so um basically what it would be though is is like a four or five segment space station that has ion propulsion which that that stuff's cool but it's i don't know i'd rather like you could just park a starship up there and it'd be bigger <laughs> yeah exactly brant just said that exactly in discord uh, leave leave a starship in orbit instead of gateway. I mean, exactly. It would be substantially bigger. So I don't know. Gateways gateways cool, but it doesn't quite close to me honestly. Uh, we school again. How's it going, We school? I yeah. Thank you, We school. Uh, nice back to back coverage. Your Boca vacation. <laughs> I, I wish it was a vacation. We were we we're joking about how we've never been to the pool, never really been to the beach, never been down like anywhere really. <laughs> It's like we just sit here and work on stuff. Uh, nice back-to-back -back coverage. Your Boca vacation is beginning to sound like that trip to Mars. Donation for the for Miko uh, Hotel or Studio B Fund. Did Sentry catch the event? First off, thank you again, We, we School. Uh, I believe Sentry did catch it, but it intentionally does not record on your USB drive, I think, just for safety. Um, but, yeah, they. Uh, I, I believe it is internal. I'll have to get that uh, footage from Tesla. I think you have to request the footage when you actually are in an accident. So um, that's something that I'll be doing because uh, I would be curious. 
we actually, you know, we did have two cameras rolling, and one was that kind of that from the passenger seat, and one was from the back seat. The back seat camera it had stopped in the middle of our stream, and therefore it stopped recording. Uh, when it started back up, it didn't go back to recording. Uh, otherwise, that would have had right out the windshield view, and it would have been very scary. So, yeah. Uh, Ron, or Eve, a bunch of numbers, um, <laughs> says, uh, hmm, now I'm curious how Guinness Book of World Records will look like in sports given the lower gravity of Mars. Yeah, it'll definitely have to be a different, like sports on Mars and stuff and, and all that stuff will have to be a totally different thing for sure. So, um, good, good question there. Uh, yeah, it's not going to be like Earth record or anything. Yeah. Uh, because that wouldn't be fair. That would not be fair at all. And also, real quick, by the way, again, back to We School. Everyone just say thank you to We School. Uh, that is the two really generous donations that We School has done lately. So thank you. Uh, it really, really uh, not necessary, but thank you so much. Uh, Robert Yates, considering the difficulty SpaceX had convincing NASA to allow a load and go fuel up for crew launches, will SLS now use load and go or be preloaded? Uh, it'll be preloaded. Yep. Um, It'll kind of be sitting there and, and ready to go. Yeah, it, it's it's not that they would never change something like that. Uh, you know, uh, there was some weird talk. I feel like I did actually hear someone weird, some mention of something that they would almost load and go, but it, it definitely wouldn't be SLS. That's not that's not the way they do those things. But man, um, that's a good question. But no, I, I mean, it definitely not. SLS will, will be the traditional way of doing things where you have the fuel. Sorry, I should I should explain real quick. The, the fuel is normally uh, like on Delta IV or Atlas V or basically any rocket uh, for the most part before Falcon 9. Uh, you load the propellants on the vehicle, get it into a stable state where you're not transferring fuels or anything like that. It's just sitting there pressurized and you're just kind of topping it off and keeping it uh, up to pressure. Then, uh, then they put the crew in the vehicle and then, uh, you know, close up the hatch and, and launch, right? Uh, that's the normal way of doing things, even though that seems backwards to me. I feel like you should still not have crew and, and pad crew, you know, pad personnel and stuff like that near the rocket while it's full of fuel just does seem, cause it is under a lot of pressure too. Uh, but I, you know, I, yeah, I don't know. Uh, the Falcon nine does things differently though. They, they literally load the vehicle while it's completely empty. And then, uh, they already have the uh, abort system armed and then they start fueling up the rocket. So if there were to happen to be a problem during fuel up, during the actual fueling process, they could get out of there. They could yeet out of there. Uh, but I don't know. That still makes more sense to me because you're not exposing any ground personnel or anything to any of that stuff. But, yeah. I'm Andreas. Um, <laughs> go to sleep now. No, we got to finish up this launch. We got about four or five more minutes here before they actually do the, the, pay, the deploy of the satellite so and then I'll, I'll go right back i'll try to go right back to sleep but we'll see uh carlos doria thank you very much for the membership uh d dr jmp um this is uh jagadish patil from india what happens to the second stage engine after deploying the satellite the second stage will after it deploys the satellite for lower throw missions like this it will turn itself around and do a small deorbit burn and then it will burn up basically almost right where it just went by that's kind of a a graveyard orbit right there uh, right off the coast kind of in the Indian Ocean uh, right like south of India west of Australia east of Africa there's actually this patch where a lot of orbits they will intentionally do these graveyard orbits while they are uh, it's basically where you re-enter and splash down there is even an exclusion zone there for planes and boats and shipping traffic so you don't actually have a rocket falling on you so yeah, not a graveyard orbit, sorry, yeah, but like a rocket graveyard. Yeah, sorry, like a literal graveyard. A graveyard orbit is different. So sometimes uh, on, on highly uh, energetic missions like geostationary transfer orbits, they'll actually kick it out into this graveyard orbit where it's not going to interfere with anything else. All right, this is from K... Uh, thank you very much, KPD uh, Waro Man. I, I appreciate that. That's really nice. Uh, Mouse Mac. Uh, never going to be able to get anything from your store due to shipping costs. Sucks to be in the UK. Yeah, I'm, uh, I, I am sorry. And uh, we, we've done, hopefully it'll get better. Honestly, that sh we did see shipping go up like 25% internationally last year. And that's that's rough. Uh, but hopefully our, our new shipping system is, is quite a bit better. It's way faster. That's for sure. Um, people, even if you don't do the express shipping, are, tend to get them in Europe within a week even. 
Um, so yeah, I, I'm hoping, yeah, hoping that it does get better still. Ryder, um, I'm from the UK. Brexit was an off idea. You know, yeah, I, I don't quite personally understand the benefit, but we'll see. We'll see how, you know. Um, and this is from um, Chininator. Are we getting uh, SN9 static fire today? We are hoping for that. Uh, it's really foggy right now, but of course, that is the morning. It, it's pretty normal. Uh, but we are hoping to see static fire today. We will see if that's the case. We will absolutely see if that's the case. Um, John Noble, um, Brexit import taxes will be sorted in the next few months. Okay, cool. That'd be great. That would be great. Uh, let's see here. From Josh, I live in San Antonio and can bring your car back to you. Just trying to be a good neighbor since your insurance is not. Well, thank you very much, Josh. I don't know the best way to, to handle or manage that because I actually think I would have to take delivery of it. Um, but I'll have to figure something out. But thank you very much for the offer, Josh. That's that's very nice. Um, this is from Deborah. says, uh, Tim, I want to buy a normal t-shirt. Can't find it in the shop. Any suggestions? Well, let me... Double check here. It's right here under apparel. So just click apparel uh, on the shop. And Norminal was right down here. Normal T. The normal T and the normal hat are right next to each other. So, And if you ever can't find anything, too, there is a little search bar. So if you type in Norminal, uh, you'd be able to find it as well. So hopefully that helps. Uh, yeah, just right under apparel. It's not under tiny humans or prints or anything. Like that just, just apparel. So, yeah. Um, thank you very much, Deborah. Hope you, hopefully you find that. From Mike saying um, over uh, over or under sixty five percent that in the first uh, crewed mission to the moon with landing the capsule or lander will be called the Columbia Eagle or Apollo. Oh geez, um, I feel like it's pretty high. Uh, I was I'm kind of disappointed that we just keep reusing the same names for spacecraft over and over and over. I would say I'm I'd say over 65% that the first crewed capsule with the, the moon landing uh with the capsule or lander we will have a Columbia an Eagle or an Apollo in one of those three um or or Snoopy I mean I don't even know uh yeah I'm over <laughs> for sure uh Paul Hansen says with the SpaceX store no longer carrying polos have you thought about maybe starting to do offer something similar yes Paul we are actually working on a dress line uh, Thomas says reference frame is surface, not orbit. Ha ha. There we go. So that must be where the, that difference in velocity comes from. That that actually makes a lot of sense. That I think that that is the answer for sure. That the reference frame is surface, not orbit. Um, Austin, is the speed something to do with total potential energy of elliptical? Uh, could it be trading kinetic for uh, gravitational potential? Uh, no. Yeah. That's um, no. They they. They're not showing you, like, the amount of total energy uh, expended. That would actually be... You can kind of do that with the C3, it's called. Uh, the C3 for total energy. It's kind of like measuring your delta V in C3. Um, that's something similar, but that's not... This was just simply uh, velocity. All right. Uh, St. Castle. With Starship, how long would it take to get to Mars? A Starship will have about a six-month transfer to Mars and then six months back. Um, unfortunately, you can't do them back-to-back. -back. You can't just go there and back. You do have to wait until the planets realign. So it's six months there. You wait basically a year and then uh, come back six months later uh, or six months then. So, yep, take six months. Um, you could speed that up a little bit. You could get five or four or three months. Um, if you, but you have to spend more Delta V to do that. So, yeah. Um, Elizabeth says, um, hey, can you give a shout out to Miss G's class in Michigan? Yes, Elizabeth. Hello, Miss. Uh, so uh, it looks like. Uh, Miss Miss Godeber, sorry, but hello, Miss G, and thank you for having your students watch this early in the morning. You guys are in school already. Was school always that early? Uh, good morning, though, Miss G's class. How's it going, my friends in Michigan? Hopefully, you're staying warm. But thank you for tuning in, and thank you for watching a rocket launch this morning. Uh, that's awesome, Steve's Jeep. Any thoughts on the new NASA administrator? Jim was awesome. Um, do we actually know for sure who's new? Has there been a new named admin? There's an acting administrator, I think, right now, but I don't think there's been an, an admin named. By the way, look at that chunk of solid oxygen right there uh, on that valve. That was cool. Uh, but yeah, Jim was awesome. Jim was amazing. Um, I don't have any thoughts on the new NASA admin yet because I don't know if we actually know who the new 
And Min Eve is yet. We, we have some ideas of picks, but I don't think there's been anyone officially confirmed at all. So, uh, yeah, Jim Jim did a fantastic job. I would have loved to see if Jim could have stuck around. I know that's not really how that stuff works, but that would have been uh, amazing if Jim had stuck around. That would have truly helped, I think, with some of the, the bipartisan uh, attitude of NASA. But I think Jim was kind of tired of, of all that extra hard work because I think they definitely put him to work, that's for sure. From... Uh, Raman Milik says, love your work. Really appreciate what you're doing. Thanks and keep it up. Well, thank you very much, Raman. I appreciate that. And then uh, this is from Quantum. Is it possible to send a crew dragon to the moon and return using a Falcon Heavy? Uh, it can't get into orbit. There's you can see, A Falcon Heavy can send a, a kind of a stripped down crew dragon. Uh, not necessarily stripped down, but you can't have any... You don't have much margins, but you can do a uh, flyby of the moon. So you can't get into lunar orbit. So it couldn't be used for lunar orbit missions, but um, yeah. So you can send a crew to the moon and back, but it's not. It'd be like an Apollo Eight style. That's what a, the Dear Moon mission was originally going to be, something like that. And then they ended up uh, switching it to Starship now, just because that makes more sense, and it would be cheaper. So um, yes and no, it is possible, but it's not possible to get into orbit. And that's one of those things that we're going to be talking about for sure on an upcoming video, kind of explaining what it would take to replace um, Orion and or SLS to be able to do that stuff for the Artemis missions. We will be talking about that uh, in a great, in a, a good amount of detail. You know, could you use Falcon Heavy? Could you use Delta Four Heavy? Could you use Vulcan? Could you use New Glenn? What other options are there? And we will go through all of those options. And even weird things like, what if you put a Delta IV uh, upper stage on a Falcon Heavy? Like do some kind of like Kerbal style things to see what our options are. Um, from uh, Garga says, how many of the Starlink satellites, uh, how many Starlink satellites are already up there? Uh, we actually did mention that in our pre-launch preview here, um, that there's 1,013 Starlink satellites launched. So yeah, that's how many how many there are. So uh, let's see, from, from Juan says, do you think it is possible to dock a ship with a space station with a different orbit? But with a common um, orbit point, no, because you're, the reason that you're, the reason that if you, even if you intersect, uh, you can't dock with it because you'd be going at different speeds. So you have to, by matching your speeds uh, and literally matching your speeds, you're, you're exactly matching your orbits. So your relative speeds would be like completely different. So even if the, your orbits do intersect, you'd go flying by at like you know, uh, any any speed other than zero, you're not going to be able to dock, right? So. Um, yeah, it, it's it's not possible to dock in that case, and, and as soon, even if you were able to like dock really quick, you'd get pulled apart because they're still um, on on slightly separate orbits. So, yeah, uh, probably not going to happen. Uh, which is those, that's one of those things like with you know the Martian and things like that, uh, where they have that like crazy. Uh, we're going to try and get out there and, and deorbit a little bit, and you're going to match up. It, it, it got a little the the physics was a little wonky i mean some of that wasn't too far-fetched but um some of it was not exactly that good <laughs> oh man so how is everybody else doing though um i i, well, I want to know what you guys think give me your percentage that you think uh, that we'll see static fire today of sn9 and then give i want two percentages like a percentage here and then slash so don't type it yet um Percent you think we'll see it happen today, and then percent you think will happen to see the flight by the weekend of SN9. I'm, I'm kind of, uh, I'm thinking we're about. I'm feeling like sixty percent. Welcome back to our webcast. Oh. We had an on-time liftoff this morning, and again, our Life Leader vehicle completed the first eighth flight and recovery for a Falcon 9. Now we're coming up on the deployment of our stack of Starlink satellites in just a few seconds here. So we will listen in and watch live as the payload deploys. I love watching the payload deploy. For a little while they weren't showing us this, but now they seem to, like cats out of the bag, people can see how we do this, I guess. Mm -hmm. Yep, <laughs> yeah, once it's, once it's happened once, Obviously, uh, who cares after that? We've got the sun beaming into our camera view there. Don't forget, they do roll these things. Oh, cool. Payload deploy confirmed. 
There it goes. It is rolling like this. It's what rolling. you are seeing live are those Starlink satellites in space drifting away from our second stage, which confirms deployment. Shortly, they will deploy their solar array, and over the next few days and weeks, they will distance themselves from each other and use their onboard ion thrusters to make their way to their operational orbit. Beautiful live view. Love that. And that brings our webcast to a close. Thank you to the range and the FAA for supporting today's mission. And thanks to all of our viewers, as well as all of those in the US, Canada, and the UK who ordered Starlink under our public beta program. If you're interested in being a part of our beta program, head over to starlink.com and sign up. Thanks for joining us and have a great day. Sweet. Nice and easy there, guys. Again, they, they definitely make this stuff just look, honestly, too easy. <laughs> they really, really do. Um, so I'm going to end with one more question here from um, St. Castle saying, uh, six months, uh, any info on interior design of Starship? Would there be artificial gravity or is it going to be zero G for six months? So um, don't forget, you know, of course, Starship is, is iterative. Uh, we don't necessarily have any details yet on the interior. We likely... We might see some of those pop up, you know, especially if we start seeing stuff happen for the human landing systems. But I, I assume that they are working on the interior mock-ups of Starship and some interior designs and things like that. But as far as going out to Mars, uh, it's only six months of zero-G. That's that's the exact same amount of, uh, you know, zero-G experience that a, a normal crew rotation on the International Space Station experiences. And it's it's not great, you know, it's not great for your body, but it takes about a day or two to recover. So it would just have to be in the mission planning that, hey, guess what? Uh, when you get to Mars, as soon as you land, you're going to have to be doing some some recouping and, and working on getting your strength back and, and helping you, you know, not be sick and, and just kind of uh, get you back on your feet. Literally, just a slow, iterative thing. And, you know, these the first missions to Mars are going to be kind of winging it. They're kind of not winging it, but they're going to be they're going to be more rough and more dangerous and less creature comforts and less they're, they're going to have to do higher risk things than I think, you know, than like what we're used to now. It'll be riskier to go to Mars than it is to the International Space Station. Spoiler alert. So astronauts that sign up for it uh, will have to accept higher risks. NASA and or who, whatever uh, body of uh, organization or whatever will have to also accept higher risks. And some of those risks are like, yeah, you know, you're, you're going to be wobbly for a couple of days on Mars. Uh, obviously they probably won't leave the vehicle, even though they'll be sitting on the surface of Mars for a while. Um, but you know, once they're safe and, and acclimated to back to gravity and things like that. Um, yeah. Um, yeah, uh, this is also, yeah. From Ro, Ro, um, Robo gamer five, five, five in our discord says at the same time, we don't know how the human body will react to a third G that's, that's true. Um, it, yeah, there's always, I, I've mentioned this quite a few times. We don't, we don't know yet. We don't have enough data on is you know if zero g does we know what zero g does to our body the effects it does we know what one g does to our body we have all together about uh three weeks of total time ever on the moon uh or two uh, i'll tell you the two weeks total amount of human time on the moon um that's not a lot it's not a lot of data so we don't know you know we don't even know like is one six gravity uh almost as good as you know like is it is it is it linear is it uh, zero gravity is, is this bad for you? One six is one six is bad. You know, uh, half is half as bad. And one G is our normal daily experience. Uh, so we don't know, or is it, or is it like a little bit of gravity actually goes a long ways. Like is one six gravity 70%, uh, you know, help prevent things like bone density loss or, or nausea and things like that. Um, you know, we, we don't know that correlation yet. That's something that's going to take time. So there, there's definitely things that, that we'll see. But as far as artificial gravity, maybe eventually later on we can do tethering starships and all those fun plans. But um, don't forget, if, if you're producing, uh, yeah, if you're producing substantial G-forces, even half a G by a tether, that's going to be a pretty beefy tether. You know, that'll be like, that. that's not going to be free of mass. So, uh, yeah, I... Um, I, for now, you know, the, the first missions for sure will, will just be zero G. So, um, all right. From Martin says, how much, uh, do you think SpaceX will charge for a moon landing mission with the starship 
moon landing mission with Starship? I have no idea, unfortunately. But, you know, eventually, I, I, I still think that the first bunch of times we'll see Starship fly with people, they'll actually park it up in orbit. And at first, they'll just put it, uh, they will put Crew Dragon and, and you know, get, get Starship up in orbit, get it refueled, get it ready to go for its mission, and then send Crew Dragon up there with a Falcon 9. And uh, and once Crew Dragon is up on orbit, you know, that's a safe way to get through ascent and through reentry. So if that's the case, that'll be very cost prohibitive because that will be, you know, $50 million a seat. So um, you're looking at basically $50 million plus, we'll say, I don't know, five more million, five more million dollars per seat to get to the moon or something. I don't know what they could charge. So, you know, they might be able to do it for under 50 million ish uh, using that method. But in theory, they can get you to the moon really, really, really cheap. If, you know, if the cost is like a million dollars or less per launch and it takes, say, three launches to actually fuel up Starship enough or four maybe, you know, um, and if they're selling dozens of seats, they could do it surprisingly cheap. So we'll see. We will absolutely see. That's that's a one of those fun things to think about where we'll be in 10, 20 years from now. So, um, but I, I, think, I think they could probably get away with charging millions of dollars, of course. So... Um, I don't see any need, you know, if no one else, yeah, they might be able to do it for cheaper than that. It, you know, again, if you're bypassing dragon, um, you know, if, if they could charge $10 million a seat, I think they would sell those like hotcakes. I know that sounds like a lot of money, but there's definitely some wealthy enough people and countries that would want to send someone to the moon, uh, for their space program. So, yeah. All right. This is, um, them, uh, thimble through, probably totally mispronounced that. God bless you, Tim from, um, from SA, love your work, bro. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate that. Thanks for saying hi. And, uh, yeah, you're awesome. And we have a new membership from Alex Hawk, as well as a question. Um, when do you think we'll see the first crude starship launch? So I, I was just kind of talking about, I don't think the first crude crude ones, this is just my opinion. Uh, I, I don't think the very first crew and crude ones would actually have, uh, would have people going from launch and landing. I think they'll park a starship up in orbit. I mean, I think that could be in four or five years. We could actually see crew crew inside of Starship in space. That's how I'll put it. But as far as actually launch and landing in Starship, I think we're I think we're a little ways away from that. I think we're that that'll be two or three more years after that. But um, oh, SA equals South Africa. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, there we go. Awesome. Uh, but yeah, I that that's a good question. But I. Well, we'll just have to see. It's so hard to predict these timelines, especially when something is accelerating. Because it seems like in some ways we're very optimistic about, like, yeah, maybe we'll see an orbital launch this year. And it's hard to tell how long things will take from then on because things are accelerating and it's, it's getting a lot faster. So, um, all right. And this is from Jacob. This will be the last one. 7.2 is on the move. Check Lab Padre Sentinel Cam. So, yeah, it sounds like they're, they're pushing uh, 7.2 out to the pad as we speak. So that means we won't see a static fire until the pads clear getting S, uh, 7.2. That's uh, 7.2 is the, the Starship uh, test little vehicle. It's just like a, a burst tank, basically, that they, they use to test stuff. Uh, that is currently on the move between the factory and the, the pad. Uh, if, it was, if it was a clear enough day, we'd probably easily be able to see that. But it's so stinking foggy that it's not going to be an option right now. So, um, yeah, so we will see. We'll see how much that pushes back back static. We could still see static fire today, but um, that could be something that that also delays static fire. And it will be interesting to see that that will be on the stand, and so will uh, you know start SN nine. So that'll be fun to see that much hardware out there. So cool. All right, guys, I'm gonna get out of here. Oh, one more from Joey. Um, let's see. This is from Joey. Best place to see Starship launch uh, and, and as Padre would definitely be uh, the Isla Blanca Park. It's the southernmost tip of South Padre. You are basically exactly five miles away, ten. Uh, so eight, five miles, eight kilometers away. Uh, it, it's definitely the best place to be. Um, other than that, there are some views from from Port Isabel, like from the the bridge area. There's people that have gone from the the docks over there in Port Isabel, saying it's a great view too. That's also pretty close. I mean, there's there's, yeah, there's a lot of options. The Holiday Inn uh, area has like this really cool rooftop bar and stuff like that. There's there's a lot of yeah, there's a lot of options. You're, you're not going to have a, a shortage of views here uh, at South Padre Island for anything Starship. That's for sure. All right, guys, I'm going to get out of here. Um, thank you guys so much for tuning in. Uh, I really appreciate you guys uh, all hanging out and saying hi. 
Uh, like I said, if you want to support what I do and help me continue to do what I do, consider becoming a Patreon supporter by going to patreon.com slash everydayastronaut. Uh, I truly appreciate that support. It makes all this stuff possible. And get ready because we've got some really, really, really cool things that we are working on. I promise. So that's going to do it for me. I'm Tim Dodd, the Everyday Astronaut, bringing space down to Earth for everyday people. Goodbye, everybody.